We're in a series, um, Does God Want Me to Be Happy? Uh, And it's a fairly loaded question. um, And on the surface level, it looks like happiness would just be maybe those external feelings of happiness. The thrust of the series, the meat of it, has centered around this topic, really not of happiness, but of joy. Now, we've done our best over the past couple weeks to say there is some overlap that joy and happiness do coincide together, but they are also distinctly different. And what God promises to his people, followers of Jesus, is a, uh, an unshakable, eternal joy. And it's not just a feeling, but a posture to live our lives from. And I don't know about you, and I do know about you, actually. You live in the same world I live in, and we just need a little bit more joy. There's a lot of bad news. There's a lot of tragedy. There's a lot of difficulty, whether it's globally, culturally, within this time in history, or just things that we're going through in our own personal lives. So joy is so central and necessary for the follower of Jesus and ultimately for our world, I would say. So if you have your Bible, open up to John chapter 16. We have two more teachings in this series today, and then next week for Christmas Eve, John 16 is where we'll be. We're picking up in a discussion that Jesus is having with his disciples. We'll begin in verse 16, John 16, verse 16, and as is the custom of our house, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. John 16, 16 says this, Jesus went on to say, In a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. He's talking about his death that's coming up, his crucifixion. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you're going to see me no more, and then after a little while, you're going to see me, and because I am going to the Father? And they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Verse 19, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking uh, one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you'll see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn into joy. It'll turn, it'll completely shift to joy. And then he throws in this metaphor in the middle of it, a woman Giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming where I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. And in that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. What do you want for dinner? It's a common question that gets asked in our house, and I'm sure in yours as well. One of the frequent answers when that question is posed amongst my kids, especially my son, is Chipotle. Last night uh, was no different. We played this out. We headed to Chipotle. We got there. Uh, We got in line, both Bear and Sunday. My youngest were with me. They were pumped. They were dancing in line. They were excited to get their food. They were actually playing nice with each other in this moment, which must be that Chipotle is a little bit of heaven on earth in that place. They're playing nice. They're having a good time. And it was a great night until it wasn't. Uh, The kids usually get the build-your-own tacos, um, and they have very limited options that they like. Tomatoes, corn, cheese, and guacamole. Always guacamole until there's not. Uh, We're all out of guacamole, is what the worker said to me. To which my son overheard that and responded by sliding his body down the wall, crying, sitting his butt on the ground and saying, what? No guacamole. (laughs) To which I looked at him calmly and explained to him, you better get to your feet right now. (laughs) 
which he stands up and begrudgingly from his happiness now to despair, he then states with every bit of fervor and angst, I'm not eating it without guacamole. And I said, well, it looks like you're not eating it then. And then we went to the grocery store and got guacamole. (laughs) What happened? You were just so happy. And then you weren't. I want to talk to you today for just a few moments from this subject. Joy when you're not happy. Joy when you're not happy. I want to take the sayings of Jesus that we just read in John chapter 16. And if I could just work through a few of these verses and extrapolate a couple thoughts that might be very applicable to where we find ourselves in this moment. Right now, there is a field of study that's come about over the past few years in academia, and it's emerged and it's called happiness studies. And it's an attempt within the academic field and an academic approach to the idea of pursuing a more content and more meaningful life. I think if I could, what we find in Jesus' words in John 16 is the 2,000-year initiation of that search for humanity, and that Jesus lays out a necessity for his followers. The idea, maybe not of happiness, but something deeper, something I would say is more sustainable and stronger, and that is the concept of joy. Uh, It would be helpful, though, as we've done over the past few years, and I mentioned a few moments ago, um, that we should differentiate between the idea of joy and happiness just a little bit. Uh, One maybe picture that could be helpful is that happiness and joy flow from opposite rivers. Happiness flows from the outside in. It's like a runoff from a mountain snow. It's coming down the mountain. So whatever happens externally that uh, is what I want to have happen then flows into me and makes me happy. My kids are playing nice together. My job is going good. My relationships are great. It's the Christmas season. I'm going to have presents, whatever it might be. It's the external river that flows in, which we could label as happiness. That's why oftentimes you hear the concept of happiness being related to happenings. Whatever is happening determines whether or not I'm happy. It's the external river flowing in. The idea of joy, especially biblical Christian joy, is that it doesn't flow from the outside in, but joy flows from the inside out. It's like an underground spring that overflows endlessly. And that's why the Bible talks about Jesus being our deep joy, an understanding of our faith. I would say this, a cosmic joy, one that is eternal and that is not temporary, that sustains us even in difficult times and allows us to stand in the midst of unideal or non-ideal happenings and still be okay that I can still maintain a level of joy even if the things outside flowing in aren't exactly what I would want to have happen. And there's people that we know in life, and you probably can think of somebody, that look externally happy. And when we're talking about this idea of joy and happiness and maybe kind of conflating the two, there's individuals that might be externally happy, especially if they're extroverted, they're always laughing, maybe they're the life of the party, they're the person that you go to when you want to hang out and have a good time. But you know somebody, just like I know somebody, that's kind of fit that mold. But then when you look at the deeper parts of their life and when they're honest, they're not as happy internally as they show externally. We've seen that and been shocked by that even with individuals within Hollywood. Look at the great late Robin Williams, one of the funniest people of all time, one of the greatest actors ever. And you look at the way that he poised and carried and postured himself. We got to enjoy his his art in film and in interviews and hearing stories of how he made other people feel even behind the scenes was one of kindness and joy and happiness. And yet internally, that wasn't the reality. That wasn't the brook that was bubbling up. That wasn't the river that was flowing from his life to the point where he ended up tragically taking his own life. Now, what we're saying and what I'm saying in this series is not Christian joy means internally you're good and externally you're always going to be good. It doesn't mean that Christians don't go through difficult seasons. It doesn't mean that Christians don't have moments of sorrow or of grief or of pain or of sadness. Christians actually, as Dr. Timothy Keller said, can have a lot of sorrow. In fact, in some ways, Christians, if we are really following Jesus, 
are going to serve and want to serve people in the way that he did, have to remember, we must remember that Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And if you and I are willing to not be too self-protective and we get involved in people's lives and we live a life of humility and one of service and one that gives, inevitably, we're going to face in some way some form of pain, disappointment, or sadness. Christians in some contexts might be sadder people, but underneath, whereas the people who are always happy on the surface, but sad underneath, Christians, it's the opposite. Though we might face external disappointment or somebody might turn their back on us or because we try to serve or live or love in a way that's open-handed and we deal with the difficulty that we deal with, externally we might be sad, but internally there's a joy that should sustain us. It's sort of like a Christian joy that goes deep down into the recesses of the heart and gives us a resolve. And that's why time and time again, over almost 20 years of being a pastor, I have been able to have conversations with individuals who are going through detrimental things, it seems, externally, and yet have a posture and a position of saying, but I'm gonna be okay. God's still good. Have you ever met somebody or had a conversation with somebody who they have every reason to not consider God to be good, and yet that's their stance? What is that? I I think there's a lot of things. There's a level of faith, and there is a level of resolve and resiliency and fidelity to Jesus even in that. But I would say whether they can even put language to it or not, that's an element of Christian joy that it's something that causes you to stand and have a perspective on a world, even though I might not feel happy, I'm able to withstand because it is the joy of the Lord that is my strength. Jesus goes on and he says this, but I'll see you again and you're gonna rejoice. And then he makes this statement, and no one will take away your joy. I mean, that's a pretty dogmatic statement. And when Jesus talks to his disciples here in John 16, he's just not talking to that group of 12. He's talking to all believers. If you're a follower of Jesus in here or watching online, that's a statement made to you and to me as well. The joy that he gives will not be taken away. But what happens when it seems like it has been taken away? What happens when you don't feel joy anymore? What happens maybe when you don't sense God anymore? Have you ever had that where it's like, I'm just going through a really dry season. I don't feel like I actually can sense God or I don't even know that he's with me. I don't know that he's listening. I don't know that he actually cares. I mean, I believe in him and and now you're telling me he's given me this joy and that this joy can't be taken away, but I've been feeling pretty dry for a while, Noah. I'm in a pretty rough season. What, What could actually potentially be happening? And this is where I think maybe we can get some insight from some ancient Christian thinkers uh, that gave a layout and some language to what happens. Um, A lot of times in our Christian life, especially when we first become a follower of Jesus, and this goes through seasons, it's cyclical, what'll happen is you have your starting point, whatever, I gave my life to Jesus, or I'm just in a really good season with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit's moving, and, and I'm reading my Bible, and I'm actually kind of understanding it, that's amazing. Uh, worship is really good, and I, f- I feel the felt sense, the felt presence of God, and uh, Christian community is going really good, and I love all this uh, that God is doing in my life, and I'm just excited to wake up and have another day with God, and there's this moment where we're just sensing God, and we're kind of on this spiritual high, and we have these moments throughout our Christian journey. This is why you have uh, junior hires and high schoolers that will go to camp, and you get them in like a four-hour worship session, Their hands are raised and they're just crying and they're forgiving their friends and they come home and they're waking up early and reading their Bible and the parents are kind of like, what's going on? And they're super pumped. What, they're they're having a moment with God. But how many of you know, you don't have to live too long with Jesus to all of a sudden feel like it's starting to decline. Ah, The Bible just doesn't make any more sense. And I, I don't feel like I'm getting any understanding in. And I don't sense or feel God in worship. And I am so annoyed with every member of my community group. I don't want to be friends with any Christians anymore. And and we go through all of these feelings and these emotions. And so what once went up 
now it begins to go down. And uh, this isn't a new phenomenon. This has been throughout all of Christian history. And people way smarter than I began to study this and kind of track it. And they came up with what the, what's known as consolation and desolation. Consolation and desolation. On the up, when things are going good in our life, I'm going to put a C here, that's consolation. I sense God, I feel God, I'm excited about God, I, I'm getting things again from scripture, I just feel like my prayer life is great, I, I'm, I'm just pumped. And then when we hit the dry seasons, that's desolation. I'll put a D there for desolation. By faith, we know that God is always thinking of us. We know that God's always with us. He's interested in our lives and he's loving us with kind of this personal, determined love. We know that by faith. And so when we realize that, that removes us for just a moment from the feeling aspect of what we go through on our journey with Jesus. When it comes to the idea of consolation and desolation in our spiritual lives. Again, consolation, the felt presence of God. Desolation is that absence of that feeling. It's not that God is absent. It's that I don't feel or sense God. So what do I do in desolation? What do I do when I don't feel joy? What do I do when I don't feel the fullness of God or that he's talking to me or that he's even listening to me? We'll talk about that in a moment. So we don't always feel it in our emotional world, as one writer said. In fact, sometimes we can feel an intense and painful emptiness inside. Sometimes we can feel absolutely no excitement or pleasure at the thought of spiritual things. Sometimes we can feel dry as a desert, even when we are at prayer. Emotionally, we don't even want to keep praying. This lack of the felt presence of God or desolation is a lack of emotional pleasure or resonance regarding God's will for us. It's usually referred to, again, by spiritual writers as sensible desolation. The contrary is sensible consolation. And so you have all of these moments here again of enjoyment and I'm sensing God and God's moving and it feels like every prayer I'm praying is getting answered. And then all of a sudden we get to this point where it's dry, there's no emotion involved, there's no external enjoyment or pleasure from following after God. And I just wonder if God's actually even there or existing at all. And here's the thing, this happens to everybody. And so you might be in this state right here and think, I'm all alone. I think I'm losing my faith. And I would say, you're just on the journey of faith. Because what ends up eventually happening when you stick with it is you are going to come back around and you're going to have moments of consolation again. You're going to have moments of encounter and breakthrough. That's why there is a value that joy gives you to stand and endure through hardships to endure through difficulties or dry seasons, to endure and stick with Jesus even when you don't understand. I got questions, I got doubts, I got skepticism, kind of galore in my soul right now, but I'm gonna stick with you. I wanna, I wanna go on this journey with you. And one of the key things to help get us out of desolation, we don't have time to talk about this, but is the spiritual practices and disciplines. That you stay consistent you stay faithful to Jesus. You stay in the face of God through prayer, through devotional reading. This is why you should pick up a bread journal today. It's because even when I don't feel like reading the Bible, I'm gonna read the Bible. God, I don't feel like praying, but I'm gonna pray. Some of you didn't feel like coming to church this morning. It's raining outside. It's cold. We're in December in Ohio. The Browns are going to the Super Bowl. I could be home preparing for the game. Like, right, we, you had a lot of reasons and maybe you're just in a rough season. You're like, I don't even know if I believe any of this anymore, but you still came to church. What are you doing? You're staying faithful in a season of desolation. And what will eventually come back is a season of consolation. And here's another thing that they discovered is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes, we go through seasons of desolation because God leads us there. Consolation is, if I could give you an image, and some writers have said this way better than I, is like a, a baby with a bottle. And they love it. It's warm. It's hitting the spot. This is great. I love it. Life is good. And they're just super content. But then the parent takes away the bottle and all of a sudden the child is really upset. What happens is sometimes God removes, not always, 
And sometimes we go through a season of desolation because of our own sin. But sometimes God removes his felt presence so that we don't live off of the highs and the goosebumps of Christianity, but we actually in a season of desolation say, God, I don't sense anything, so all I really need is you. I don't need the goosebumps. I don't need the right worship song. I don't, need to, I don't need the words of scripture to pop off the pages all the time. God, at the end of the day, I just want you. I don't need any new church merch. I don't, need, I, don't, I don't need any new things to get me hyped on Jesus. I simply want you. And God will remove sometimes the felt presence of him because what he's doing is he's drawing us closer to him and He's revealing to us in this season some areas of our life that maybe we wouldn't have been ready to see in this season. He might be revealing some pride and some ego and some spiritual immaturity, some carnality. Because when things are going good and you're feeling Jesus, I don't know about you, I'm not always as cognizant of my sin. I'm like, baby, I can't miss Jesus is with me. I must be the most spiritually mature person that's ever lived right now. I am in the good graces. Like we are there with God. And all of a sudden when I go through a dry season, I'm, I, maybe I'm annoyed with God. Maybe I'm even angry with God. If I'll lean into this and listen, he'll start to say, no, we need to talk about that attitude that you've been having. And I couldn't bring it up in this season back then because it would have just crushed you. And you weren't ready to handle it. You weren't mature enough to handle it. But in this season, I wanna reveal some things to you and then I'm gonna grow you through it and your joy is going to be made complete and you're gonna come back into a season of consolation and you're gonna know more than you did because you went through this. And one of the things that we learn a lot about in this season coming into this season is the incredible value of joy. Is the, need, is the worldview to be able to perceive and to engage the world around me, not uh, completely contingent on if things go my way or they don't go my way, if the external river isn't flowing in and making me quote unquote happy, but that I stay faithful to God in all things and that that joy causes me to be very resilient. So where at times does my felt joy go? And you might be thinking, okay, we've been in the series about God wants me to be happy and this idea of joy, and I don't sense it and I don't feel it. I would say, possibly, it could be something to pray about. God, am I, am I in a season of desolation? And are there some things that instead of me trying to reach back for a happy feeling, are there some other things that you need to teach me? Are there some things I need to be aware of and that I can have joy even when I don't actually feel happy? What, uh, when it seems joy is missing, we have to remind ourselves that God is still present. When joy feels like he might be missing, God is still present. And here, what I think Jesus might be saying in John 16, I think he's saying that the joy that Christ gives you and me, at times it can be subdued, it can even be swamped out by sorrow, but it's never extinguished. It's never banished and it can come back and it will reassert itself, it resurfaces. So when Jesus makes this audacious claim that this joy that I give you can never be taken away, you might think, no, somebody took it away. I would say, no, it's still there. It might be suppressed. You might not be feeling it. It might be covered by a lot of different things, things that people have done to you, disappointments in life, our own sin that kind of suppresses that, but that thing is still there. Joy is still with you. Jesus has committed to giving it to us and he has and we have it. He goes on and in that metaphor that he throws out, talks about a woman giving birth and brings the concept of joy and pain together. Very truly, I tell you, he says, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn into joy. And then he goes on and talks about the idea of the woman giving birth to a child. Now, it's important to remember that when Jesus is talking 2,000 years ago about childbirth, he's talking about a time of BE. BE would be before epidurals. <laughs> Not my joke. I took it from somebody, but 
Uh, so you would imagine that potentially back then, um, compared to maybe modern day delivery, a uh, pregnancy could be a little bit more challenging, could, could even be a little bit more painful. Um, and what Jesus is saying in the moment is, is the beauty of joy is that joy will get you through the pain. Like a woman giving birth to a child, it's the joy of the child. It does not remove the pain of childbirth. But the joy of that child is what causes her to continue in the process of childbirth and labor to bring forth that kid. And there's so much joy in it that I don't know about you, but I've uh, talked to women, maybe not in my household or maybe in my household, that are like, I'm never doing that again. And then all of a sudden, they're pregnant again. Maybe we should have another kid. What happened when you were going through all that stuff? I don't know. It's the joy the joy that causes you to have a different framework for how you engage with pain. Our kids kind of hit a bout of sickness this past month and they were all sharing it around. And the other week, um, our two youngest uh, kind of got sick on vacation. Well, all three of them got sick on vacation, but the two youngest got hit the hardest. And um, I don't know if you have kids, I don't know if your kids are like mine, uh, they just don't like taking medicine, especially my son, he does not like taking medicine. But we're on vacation and my oldest daughter, Paisley, is telling my son, Bear, hey, Bear, just take the medicine. Here's the thing. And I'm listening to her explain it. She's like, it's going to be gross for like a couple seconds. But then for hours, you're going to feel a lot better. And so it's just a little bit of ickiness for a lot of feeling better. And in my head, I'm like, good luck, Paisley, trying to explain this to him. Sure enough, he bought it. Lock, stock, and barrel. She explains it to him. He looks at me, he's like, all right, dad, I want the medicine. I'm like, what the heck? I've tried everything to get you to do it. But she explained, it's like, it's a temporary pain. It's a dissatisfaction. It's not enjoyable, but it will sustain you through this. And if I could take a modern day example and kind of impose that and pair that with what Jesus is saying, is that pain is temporary, joy is eternal. And that joy actually is not just the byproduct of getting through pain, but joy is the thing that can sustain us through it. Timothy Keller goes on and he says this in in reference to to that portion of scripture, uh, Christianity or Christian joy can coexist with sorrow. In other words, it's not that when you have Christian joy, it banishes all sorrow. We just talked about that a moment ago. No, that the child's being born doesn't banish all the pain immediately, but what it does is it so fills the mother with joy that the joy gets her through the pain, helps her overcome the pain, and keeps the pain from controlling her. And Jesus is actually saying that's how Christian joy works. You have it, and you still have your sorrow. Christian joy doesn't banish the sorrow or get you to not care or not feel the pain. Rather, the Christian joy is something that gets you through it. The world's joy is based on circumstances. Where's your joy if you live in the world? The world's joy is usually in something like where my job resides and in the fact that I make good money or if I have a good relationship or I've got a good family. Your joy is based on circumstance. So what happens when the world takes that away? What happens when the circumstance changes? The answer is you go from joy to sorrow. He goes on and says, in some ways in the Christian faith, your sorrow actually pushes you into more joy. Maybe another way to put it would be this. You can put uh, salt on meat or salted meat to keep it from going bad. There's another sense in which Christian joy goes into the sorrow to keep it from going bad. And what I think he's saying is when you go through and I go through difficult seasons and maybe even sorrowful seasons, one of the powers of joy is that joy does not just eradicate the sorrow, rather it interjects the sorrow from causing and keeping the the sorrow from going bad. Meaning some people can go through sorrow and difficulty and pain and all of a sudden it just completely crumbles their life. But joy like salt with meat can get in there and preserve and keep you going. I heard a a pastor tell a story about an individual who was suffering from um, brain cancer and they were at the hospital going through the treatments and um, the nurse noted on the chart of this patient um, labeled an important comment. 
And in the middle of, uh, of her write-up about this patient dealing with brain cancer, she wrote, the patient is inappropriately joyful. <laughs> Joy interjected in sorrow. I have brain cancer. I mean, I don't have, I'm, if I'm that person, stating I have brain cancer, they have brain cancer. And I could, I could leave it at that. And I could look at the surroundings and all of the external rivers of what I see flowing into me could bring despair and pain and depression. But joy interjects itself in that sorrow and it preserves it and it causes that sorrow. It doesn't eradicate it, but it brings about another reality to where you can be inappropriately joyful. What a great label to have for your life. What do you want it to be said about you? I don't know that my life was just inappropriately joyful. Don't you realize what's happening to you? Don't you know what's going on? Don't you understand? Yeah, I get it. I see it. All the rivers are coming in. They're hitting me. But I'm telling you, I got a reservoir in my soul. There's something that sustains me and keeps me going. And when I should be crying, I'm laughing. And sometimes I do cry. And then after the crying, I remind myself, God, you have sustained me and strengthened me with your joy that cannot be taken away. And I don't wanna give it up and I don't wanna give in and I don't wanna lose it. Let my life be marked by, in one sense, inappropriate joy that I can stand in the face of whatever it is that I'm going through. We'll close here. Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian author, wrote a little booklet called Confessions. Uh, and he talks about it around the age of 50. He had kind of a, an existential crisis. Uh, he didn't have much of a faith in anything, and he was kind of part of the, the Russian intelligentsia. And he was already, at that point, a pretty well-known writer. And he began to ask his friends, hey, what happens when you die? And most of his friends would say, well, when you die, you just don't exist anymore. And he was part of a group that said, well, there's no God. And when you die, you just stop existing. And eventually the sun's gonna burn out and all of this is eventually gonna go away. Everything's going to die. And Tolstoy, God bless you, started saying, he started saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If that's the case, um, why go on? Why should I keep writing books he said, everything's meaningless in the end. It doesn't matter what I do. Nobody's gonna be around to know what happened. It doesn't matter whether I'm cruel or whether I'm good. In the end, nothing I do makes sense or a difference. Everything is meaningless. Why go on at all? And his friends responded as he writes in his booklet, hey, hey, listen, listen, you're overthinking this. Go to the beach, go shopping, you're kind of processing it too much. Just try to enjoy the life that you have. And he began to actually explain that this is why he started going back to Christianity. He said, what kind of view of the world is only livable if you don't think about what you believe? What kind of view of the world is only livable if I just don't think too much about the implications of what I believe about the world? In other words, the world's peace and joy comes from uh, not thinking too much about what we actually believe about the world. Just be there in the moment. Live it up for what time that you got. But you see what the opposite is and what you see that Jesus is saying is that the joy that you have will come from being and seeing me. So if you are a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus in this room or watching with us online um, and you don't have a lot of joy, one of the questions other than the idea of desolation might be, hey, you might not be thinking about the implications of what you believe. That if we were to sit back and say, the, the belief that I have in this world, that, that I will live forever. That, that, that Jesus shows up and has the audacity to offer me eternal life. And that as the writers of the scripture say that this current temporary life is but a breath but I will enter into a forever life. And in the forever life, there's no more sickness, there's no more pain, there's no more loss, there's no more injustice. I will see Jesus face to face. My joy will be made completely full. There's no taxes, there's no working, there's no bills to be paid. Like, exactly. <laughs> you just go down that train of thought for a little bit and you start feeling some type of way. 
I know we're not talking just about feelings, but, but what Dr. Keller is saying and the implications of the Christian faith is, is it's not just a belief left up to just dummies. It's one that's intelligent, that you think through what you believe. And as I think about the long haul of what Jesus offers and what he invites me to is a life eternal. And that's why the writers of scripture will oftentimes say, hey, keep your mind focused and your thoughts focused on the things of eternity. Actually, Paul writes, the apostle Paul will close here in Colossians chapter three, verses one and two. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. I'm gonna close with a a photo here of the North Star in a time-lapse picture. Let me move this so everybody can see as best you can. That probably doesn't help you, I'm sorry. If you're on this side. It's a really good picture, just use your imagination. You see a a time-lapse that somebody set up uh, in the desert and in the center there, just little lower of the center, you see that solid white light, that's the North Star. And this is, we know how throughout history, people that would travel and um, people in boats and across the oceans would know where to go as they would focus on the North Star. And I think what Jesus is saying in John 16, what Paul is saying in Colossians, what we're trying to say in this series is that at times life will become very dizzying. And that sometimes life doesn't work out exactly like we want it to. Sometimes it works out the exact opposite. And there's gonna be moments of blurry pain and disappointment. There's gonna be moments of, of, of happiness. There's gonna be moments of contentment. But, but what Jesus is saying is there's a joy that can't be taken. And what Paul is saying is you have to remind yourself every single day to fix your, fix your eyes on Jesus, the North Star, because he is the source and that his words are true. And what he promised me, promises me is a resilient life filled with joy that will get me through anything. And the moment I begin to take my eyes off of the North Star, I begin to look at everything around. And if I look at everything around, I'm gonna be tossed left and right, like the writer James says. With every wind and wave and every turn of life, I'm, I'm happy one day and then I'm sad the next day. I'm angry one day and I'm content the next day. Why? Because my, my happiness or my joy or my existence is based on the external circumstances that are always changing. But this is why scripture says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is our constant. He is the anchor. He is who I look to and he is daily who I read about and spend time with. And so what happens when you don't feel happy? When I don't feel happy, I'm not shaken because joy is mine and it's eternal. And it lives and it resides in my soul. And maybe at times I just have to think and remind myself about forever. That this too in this moment shall pass, but I will be with him forever. And I can't help but Think about that for just a little while and it begins to change and shift some things inside of my heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the few moments that we've had. And God, undoubtedly, all of us have different situations. Some of them may be very dizzying. Even this photo of the North Star that was up there, we kind of get that sense of so many different things moving left and right. And there's uncertainty and we're not sure how they're gonna respond or what the report is gonna be or what's gonna happen next week or this holiday season, what's happening with the family, and there are all sorts of things. But Jesus, you are our steady anchor. You are at the center of our lives. And so help us this morning, if anything, we're here to simply recalibrate and remind ourselves that the source of our joy is not a situation, is not a relationship, is not money, is not our health. And thank God for all of those things that are meant to be enjoyed, but the source of our joy is you and you are unchanging and you are resilient and you offer us something that you say cannot be taken away. And so as we get ready to close in just a few moments, God, some of us feel like it's been taken away, but I just think it's buried. And would you by the Holy Spirit begin to shake the dirt off, help us begin to uh, resurrect the joy that you've given us. And Lord, if there's things that we've done or even are doing that is suppressing the joy in our life, would you convict us of that this morning? 
so we can repent of it, invite you in to help us and grow from it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.